Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is open loop control. Our objective is to introduce open loop control and examine the benefits and drawbacks of these types of systems. The end goal of most systems is to produce some desired output. This could be the exertion of a given amount of force over a certain distance, keeping the rotational speed of a shaft inside a given range, maintaining liquid level in a tank, holding or moving an actuator and applied load to a certain position and keeping it there, maintaining the temperature in a room constant, or some other measurable result. Two general classes of controllers exist for such systems, open loop and closed loop controllers. An open loop control system is a means of process control that does not use feedback to determine if result and output has achieved the desired goal. This means that the system acts upon, but does not observe the result and output of the process that it is controlling. Consequently, while simple and relatively inexpensive, an open loop control system cannot automatically correct for errors, nor can it compensate for disturbances. Open loop control systems require human supervision to maintain output inside a given range of tolerance. We'll examine more sophisticated closed loop controllers, those systems that do use automatic feedback to regulate their operation in later lectures. A block diagram of an open loop controller has several basic components. An input corresponds to some form of controlled power apportioned to the system. It could be hydraulic or pneumatic power in the form of pressurized flow of some fluid, electrical power in the form of voltage and current, or rotational linear mechanical power in the form of torque and rotational speed, or force applied for a given distance, to name just a few examples. Input could be set manually, automatically, or it may be some pre-programmed element. An actuator is the device or collection of devices that takes that input and produces some output. Examples of an actuator might be a heater that heats up a room, a valve that opens and closes, filling or draining a tank, an electromechanical system making use of a motor drive used to control the applied voltage and excitation frequency delivered to an electrical motor that rotates with a given torque and rotational speed, or a hydraulic system making use of a proportional valve to control the flow rate and direction of a double acting cylinder or hydraulic motor. A disturbance is some external or internal influence on the actuator's output. Examples of disturbances could be fluctuations in applied load, pressure, flow rate or temperature, friction or misalignment of mechanical linkages, restrictions or leaks in fluid conductors, or anything else that may cause the actuator's output to differ from the desired set point. Finally, the output is the resultant observed effect of the input delivered to the actuator, accounting for disturbances. Example might be a room that's just a little too hot or a little too cold, or a tank that's just shy of being full, a motor that is spinning just a little too slow, or a cylinder rod that comes to rest ever so slightly short of the desired extension position. In summary, open loop control is any system driven by input only, and no feedback exists to confirm if the output yields the desired result. Despite the inability of open loop control systems to automatically regulate their operation, Open loop controllers are used all the time, principally because of cost-saving advantages. Human supervision in the form of regular observation and timely intervention are necessary for open loop controllers to regulate their output. For example, consider the climate control system employed in your lazy lab partner's lame ride. On those rare occasions he or she picks you up for class, 15 minutes late as usual, you will note the climate control system of their 1991 Ford Festiva the only car ever designed to comfortably fit half a human being, is of the open loop variety. On an unusually cold morning, you begin the commute with a heater on at full blast, and over time, temperature in the cramped interior begins to rise to that approaching comfort. However, with the heater on full blast, it doesn't stay there for very long, and in a couple minutes you're roasting. You can take a log off the fire by turning down the heater, and in desperation to escape the rising stench, crack open the window. Before long, you're freezing again, and you can put some glass in the hole and readjust the heater. Over time, human actions compensate for the disturbances such that temperature eventually stabilizes to an acceptable level, just in time to get pulled over for doing 50 in a school zone. Systems making use of open loop control ordinarily begin operation by setting some initial input condition and then letting it rip. A technician then observes the resultant output and determines if this output is acceptable. If so, the input level remains as is. If not, the input is appropriately readjusted and the system is run again. A technician does so again and again until the desired output is achieved. 
An excellent example of a tuning procedure used to adjust an open loop control system is the acceleration and deceleration control using proportional valves lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you recall, this lecture featured an iterative tuning process, whereby a technician progressively adjusted the ramp time produced by the proportional valve controller and thereby the acceleration and deceleration characteristics of the applied load. Through careful observation, the system was properly adjusted such that the applied load underwent controlled acceleration and deceleration, the cylinder fully extended and retracted, and pressure spikes were minimized by perfectly timing the opening and closure of the proportional valve. Recall it took four attempts and careful human observation to yield the desired result. Once the technician has established an input condition that produces the desired output, given ideal conditions, the open loop control system should theoretically continue to reliably produce the same output over and over. This ideal perfect scenario, however, is predicated on the totally unrealistic assumption that disturbances are predictable and constant. Should any variations in temperature, pressure, flow rate, friction, applied load, leakage, or any other influencing property occur, the system's output will vary. Part of regular service responsibilities may be the periodic adjustment of the input conditions such that the resultant output remains inside a tolerable range. The obvious disadvantage of open-loop control systems is that they rely on the subjective judgment of a fickle, mush-headed human as feedback. Factors limiting the success of open-loop control systems are human visual sensitivity, hand-eye coordination, reaction speed, endurance, and skill. While inexpensive, open-loop control is undoubtedly suitable only for the simplest of tasks, and tuning, adjustment, and maintenance of such systems can be time-consuming and imprecise. Open loop control is ill fitted to those processes beyond the limit of human perception, as well as mind numbingly repetitive actions or for actions that must occur in a hazardous environment. We'll return to discuss how some of these disadvantages can be mitigated using various degrees of closed loop control in later lectures. For now, let's take a look at a simple hydraulic system making use of open loop control. Consider a bi directional hydraulic motor being used to drive a conveyor belt at a factory that produces two items rice paper origami swans, and anvils. Despite the bi-directional nature of the motor, it's customarily run in one direction only, sending freshly folded swans and cast anvils to another part of the factory where trained dolphins package the products for delivery. Dolphins, it turns out, are extremely good at delivery. The hydraulic system makes use of an electrically actuated, continuously variable proportional valve where spool position influences both flow rate and direction. Let's assume this proportional valve makes use of a bi-directional linear force motor where voltage magnitude influences spool displacement magnitude and voltage polarity influences spool displacement direction. Assuming the linear force motor is operational inside a range of positive to negative 10 volts, let's assume positive 10 volts fully displaces the spool to the straight through position and negative 10 volts fully displaces the spool to the cross connect position. Assuming relative linearity and only a small dead zone in hysteresis, intermediate magnitude voltage signals would produce proportional, hence the name, intermediate flow rates as this graph of flow rate as a function of applied voltage suggests. In the interest of expediency, we'll just simplify the user interface as a proportional valve controller that simply issues a voltage signal to the proportional valve linear force motor. Additionally, we'll assume that the proportional valve makes use of internal closed loop control of spool position by making use of a spool position feedback sensor in the form of a linear variable differential transformer. Hysteresis between observed flow rates as voltage is on the way up versus observed flow rate when voltage is on the way down still exists. However, it's not nearly the problem one might observe without this means of internal closed loop control of spool position. At installation and commissioning, a technician is responsible for establishing several base settings. One, the main pressure relief valve setting. Two, the voltage magnitude that positions the spool such that the steady state flow rate results in the conveyor moving at an appropriate speed. And three, the ramp up and ramp down rates such that the conveyor belt doesn't jerk to a start and slam to a halt. To keep this example simple and inside the confines of a reasonable lecture, let's say the ramp up and down time are fine and concern ourselves just with the steady state speed of the conveyor belt. Let's assume the hydraulic motor drives a gearbox, which in turn drives a conveyor belt such that a rotational speed input of let's say 1000 RPM produces an ideal constant speed. 
For open loop control purposes, let's assume the technician responsible for installation and commissioning of this system is making use of a non-contact laser tachometer to read the resultant speed of the hydraulic motor. Let's say these respective values are initially set at 700 PSI, positive 10 volts, and 4 seconds for both ramp up and ramp down time. By the way, the figures presented in this lecture are arbitrarily generated and not the result of some intense calculation. You'll be happy to know that I'm trying to keep this lecture simple for the purposes of expediency. When voltage to the proportional valve is linearly ramped from 0 to positive 10 volts over the course of 4 seconds, the spool progressively shifts to the full straight through position. Flow rate to the hydraulic motor goes from 0 to maximum. The unloaded conveyor belt accelerates and stabilizes at let's say 1600 RPM, a little too fast for our particular application. While the conveyor belt is running, the technician then dials down the voltage to the proportional valve until speed stabilizes at the desired 1000 RPM. Let's say this new voltage value is equal to positive 5.4 volts. When the voltage to the proportional valve is ramped down from 5.4 to 0 volts over the course of 4 seconds, the conveyor belt undergoes a controlled deceleration and comes to a halt without the inertial load of the belt causing any pressure spike at the hydraulic motor output or cavitation at the input. All is well. Or is it? When a technician starts the unloaded conveyor belt again, this time ramping applied voltage up to only 5.4 volts over the course of 4 seconds, my question to you is this. Will the hydraulic motor rotational speed stabilize at the desired 1000 RPM? And if not, why? Keep in mind, in this simple example, absolutely nothing has changed. There is no change in pressure, flow, temperature, friction, or any other external factor. The same bird is still sitting in the same tree outside the same factory and the same song is still playing on the same radio. Everything is the same. By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. Here's what might occur. When applied voltage is ramped up to 5.4 volts over the course of 4 seconds, the conveyor belt again undergoes a controlled acceleration and when speed stabilizes, the tachometer indicates the hydraulic motor is rotating at roughly only 990 RPM. There is an obvious difference between the desired 1000 RPM and the current speed. Despite my assurances the external environment has remained unchanged, some disturbance is still influencing this system. What possible property could this technician have overlooked? Again, by all means, pause the lecture and think about this. If you're struggling and need a hint, Take a look at the graph of flow rate as a function of applied voltage. Despite an unchanged external environment, there is an internally generated disturbance. The property this technician failed to account for is that of hysteresis, and that applied voltage on the way up displaces the proportional spool a different amount than it does on the way down. Recall that voltage initially ramped up to positive 10 volts, and observing the hydraulic motor spinning way too fast, the technician dialed voltage down, placing the behavior of the proportional valve in the descending voltage curve. Ramping up to positive 10 volts and then back down to 5.4 will result in the desired output of 1000 RPM for an unloaded conveyor belt, however ramping up to only 5.4 will not. This being said, it's not that far from our desired goal. Let's say after a few minutes of fiddling, the technician discovers that ramping up to 5.5 volts results in reliable operation of this system. When applied voltage ramps up to 5.5 volts, over the course of 4 seconds, the conveyor belt undergoes controlled acceleration and speed stabilizes at 1000 RPM. When applied voltage, the proportional valve is ramped down from 5.5 volts to 0 over the course of 4 seconds, the conveyor belt undergoes a controlled deceleration and comes to a halt without the inertial load of the belt causing any pressure spike at the hydraulic motor output or cavitation at the input. This conveyor belt Making use of open loop control has been properly adjusted such that an input condition of 5.5 volts yields the desired result of 1000 RPM. Theoretically, one could walk away confident this system could reliably continue to perform this way provided no influencing factor disturbs this system. This is obviously too much to ask. Even if pressure, flow rate, temperature, friction, leakage, and any other influencing factor remain constant, since we've thus far failed to even load this conveyor belt. Let's say a box of paper swans is dropped on the conveyor belt that necessitates the exertion of slightly more pressure than the unloaded conveyor belt. Can you predict how the system would respond given the slight disturbance? Again, everything else is the same, 
It's just that the system now experiences a very slight change in applied load. By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. Here's what might happen. When applied voltage ramps up to 5.5 volts over the course of four seconds, the conveyor belt undergoes a controlled acceleration and speed stabilizes just shy of the desired rotational speed, let's say 900 RPM. Speed dropped even though the proportional valve spool is in the same position. What is the source of this reduction in speed? Again, by all means, pause the lecture and think about this. As previously, I refer to those individuals struggling to explain this reduction in speed to the graph of flow rate as a function of applied voltage. This graph assumes a constant pressure drop across the proportional valve. In this lightly loaded steady state condition, the variable restriction induced by the proportional valve experiences less of a differential. Ordinarily, the graph of flow rate as a function of applied voltage is plotted using the rated conditions which is really only a snapshot in the range from unloaded to heavily loaded. In this now loaded condition, despite being in the same position given the same applied voltage of 5.5 volts, the pressure differential across the valve has slightly decreased and flow rate through it slightly decreases. The light applied load has therefore slightly disturbed the system's once stable output. This being said, not by much. The root of this disturbance is that a proportional valve, quite like a flow control valve, is inducing a restriction in the line. Actuator speed is proportional to flow rate, and flow rate through a restriction is proportional to the pressure differential across it. Given upstream pressures remain the same, and load-induced pressure has increased, the differential has decreased, as does flow rate and thus actuator speed. I should note that there exist pressure-compensated proportional valves quite like pressure-compensated flow control valves such that flow rate is constant for a given spool position regardless of variations in upstream or downstream pressure. In this case, we're assuming we do not have this capability. Those wishing to review how variations in upstream and downstream pressure affect flow rate are encouraged to revisit the flow control valves lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. A technician wishing to readjust the input condition so that the output returns the desired 1000 RPM has a couple options at their disposal. One being readjustment of the proportional valve applied voltage and two being the adjustment of the main pressure relief valve setting. As previously, a technician can simply readjust applied voltage until the hydraulic motor stabilizes at the desired rotational speed. This time, however, a technician doesn't necessarily need to worry about hysteresis since flow rate is too low and needs to be increased. Provided a technician keeps increasing voltage until the hydraulic motor stabilizes at 1000 RPM and doesn't pass it and have to turn around, this new value should reliably achieve the desired results for our given conditions. Let's assume this value is 6.3 volts. Now, given a conveyor belt loaded with paper swans, when applied voltage ramps up to 6.3 volts over the course of 4 seconds, the conveyor belt undergoes a controlled acceleration and speed stabilizes at the desired value of 1000 RPM. In this lightly loaded condition, the pressure differential across the valve has changed, but so has valve position, so flow rate and actuator speed remain the same. Alternatively, a technician can leave the applied voltage setting alone and increase the main pressure relief valve setting such that the differential increases. However, adjusting the main pressure relief valve may not be the wisest course of action, nor even a possibility given certain components have pressure limits beyond which they catastrophically fail. If you think about it, pressure, flow, and valve position are all now interrelated means of adjusting this system's input such that the desired output is achieved. The larger point being that pressure, flow rate, and valve position or nearly independent qualities that respectively influence force, speed, and direction are now tied together at the neck, and one cannot talk about one without dragging the other two along for the chat. In this scenario, a technician has adjusted one input, applied voltage to vary valve position, and accounted for the disturbances of the light load applied to the conveyor so that the actuator speed settles at the desired 1000 RPM. Given the factory remains in swan production mode and that no changes in pressure, flow, temperature, leakage, friction, or any other influencing factor occur, this input adjustment would result in our conveyor belt moving at the desired speed. Provided things remain this way, obviously too much to ask, our open loop control system should continue to keep this conveyor belt running at the desired speed. If, for example, the swan folding machine ever ran out of paper and applied voltage remain at 6.3 volts, the unloaded conveyor belt would speed up to let's say 1120 RPM. In this unloaded scenario, 
the increased applied voltage is essentially compensating for a disturbance that is no longer there. However, as soon as a box of paper swans is dropped back on the belt, the hydraulic motor would load down and return to the desired speed of 1000 RPM. Such is the behavior of an open loop control system. Provided the disturbances that disturb the system today are exactly the same disturbances that disturbed the system yesterday, the input of an open loop control system can be adjusted for this single scenario and it will reliably continue to produce the desired result. If, however, any influencing factor changes, down to the smallest flap of an origami swan's wing, the input needs to be readjusted to account for this new disturbance. Case in point, Anvil Day. The Florida Keys needs a fresh shipment of anvils delivered stat. A fleet of trained delivery dolphins await. The moment the first anvil drops in the conveyor belt, productivity grinds to a halt. Flipper, down in the mailroom, delivers a series of angry clicks over the intercom. Fix that conveyor belt. Let's assume we start with our main pressure relief valve at 700 psi and applied voltage ramming up to only 5.5 volts. This is our initial input scenario resulting in ideal performance for the unloaded condition. In the heavily loaded condition, performance suffers. In this heavily loaded steady state condition, the variable restriction induced by the proportional valve now experiences a substantially reduced pressure differential. And despite the proportional valve being in the same position, given the same applied voltage, flow rate through it dramatically decreases. Let's say a conveyor speed drops all the way down to 725 RPM. As previously, a technician can increase applied voltage to arrive at the desired 1000 RPM output. Let's say a dramatically increased applied voltage of positive 9.7 volts does the trick and speed stabilizes at 1000 RPM. Given this new heavily loaded state, the open loop control system has been properly adjusted such that it produces the desired output. Provided the factory remains in ample production mode and no other influencing factor disturbs the system, the system should reliably continue to do so. Case in point, when the last anvil of the day tumbles off the belt, the now unloaded belt accelerates almost to the initial free running full flow state and stabilizes at let's say 1550 RPM. Given the dramatically increased speed, the conveyor belt is at a risk of ripping a stitch and if it remained in this unloaded condition for any length, it would necessitate a technician dialing applied voltage down to reduce the speed back to the desired 1000 RPM. Such is the very real behavior of an open loop control system that acts upon but does not observe its output and correct for disturbances. A human operator must constantly supervise and direct their performance. The point being that an open loop control system has no idea what it's doing and doesn't take the time to check if its output is dangerous, let alone achieving the desired goal. For this system, given a larger applied voltage and dramatically reduced load-induced opposition, flow rate and actuator speed could dramatically increase to the point of catastrophic failure. By the way, do not attempt to deliver anvils via dolphins. Turns out that dolphins, I guess, require regular intakes of air. As further evidence of the limitations of open-loop control, consider a judiciously operated open-loop control system that slowly accumulates disturbances over time. Consider a proportional valve adjusted such that proper actuator speed is achieved when applied voltage is ramped up to 6.3 volts. After a month of operating the system with regular predictable loads, a technician takes the system down for monthly maintenance. Part of the procedure calls for speed calibration, and finding no difference between desired and actual output, no voltage adjustment is warranted. Another month goes by, and let's say a small restriction is developed due to some pipe or hose that has some bend or kink because some dummy bent or kinked it by accident. Flow rate marginally reduces because of the restriction. During the calibration procedure, the technician notices a tiny lag in speed and readjusts the ramp up value to say 6.4 volts to achieve the desired steady state speed. Again, another month goes by and because of the tiny initial restriction, an accumulation of varnish or sludge is developed in the turbulent region, causing the restriction to further narrow the passage. Again, during the monthly calibration procedure, the technician notices a tiny lag in speed and readjusts the ramp up value, this time to 6.5 volts to achieve the desired steady state speed. Again and again, this process repeats itself, each time the proportional valve being readjusted to ever increasing levels of applied voltage to achieve the same steady state actuator speed. Even though it takes increasing levels of applied voltage to achieve the same results, 
the open loop control system input is being properly adjusted such that output remains constant. Everything seems fine. Then one day as part of a more intensive annual maintenance, the bent pipe or kinked hose is replaced with a new one free from any obstructions. Returning the system to service with exact input conditions it had prior to being taken down for annual maintenance results in excessively fast actuator movement that could damage the system. The reason being that the input condition has been steadily adjusted to account for an undiscovered accumulating disturbance that has suddenly vanished. Again, a properly supervised open loop control system can reliably account for only one exact combination of predictable disturbances such that output remains inside the desired range. If any influencing factor changes, even in the smallest or subtlest way, output will be affected. Be aware of the possibility of seemingly unrelated events indirectly and invisibly influencing what may be mistakenly interpreted as other more direct causes. What is obviously lacking in all of these open loop control scenarios is closure of the loop. We'll examine aspects of closed loop control in later lectures, but consider all the lost opportunities for closure in our simple example. Given the desired output of this system is actuator speed, the most logical place to look for closure is in terms of rotational speed output. Recall tuning the open loop control system necessitated the technician use a handheld tachometer as a go-between he or she in the system. Humans, despite their numerous contributions to science, medicine, and art, have a reputation for being subjective, slow, and prone to dying in harsh environments. More direct, accurate, faster, and safer means of rotational speed measurements exist. Rather than relying on a fickle, mush-headed human intermediary, consider the use of a rotational speed sensor that, through the process of transduction, represents rotational speed as a proportional voltage or current signal. In addition to increased accuracy, precision, response, and endurance, sensors don't take vacations and only very rarely show up to work hungover or still drunk. Given a desired set point of 1000 RPM, the rotational speed sensor's real-time feedback can be continuously compared to this ideal scenario, and if an error or discrepancy in excess or in detriment exists, a closed-loop control system can readjust actuator input to automatically eliminate the error without the need of a human intermediary. If for some reason measurement of rotational speed is not an option, other opportunities for closure exist. Given actuator speed is proportional to flow rate, one could use a flow meter that through the process of transduction represents flow rate as a proportional voltage or current signal. Similarly, given pressure drop across a valve is proportional to flow rate through it, two pressure transducers, one either side of the proportional valve, can be used to calculate the pressure differential across it. This pressure differential data can be used to calculate the flow rate, and in turn, flow rate can be used to quite like the process of transduction, the measurement of some real-time output is often a game of telephone where one piece of data is exchanged for another, ultimately yielding a feedback signal that can be compared with a desired set point. While closed-loop control is most efficient and responsive when the feedback and set point signals are analog voltage and current signals proportional to the representative quantity, other mediums of control exist, including but not limited to hydraulic or pneumatic pilot signals and mechanical feedback. For example, consider a load sensing pumping arrangement, a type of closed loop control using oil-based pilot signals. Recall from the hydraulic pumps lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel that a load sensing pumping arrangement is one in which a pressure compensated variable displacement pump senses not only pressure at its outlet, but also pressure at an additional pilot location. Given two pressure values, the pressure compensated variable displacement pump with load sensing can therefore sense the pressure differential across a regular directional control valve. Flow rate therefore can be determined if the pressure differential is known. In this scenario, the variable displacement pump directly controls flow rate, whereas in our previous example, we used a fixed displacement pump and the proportional valve is the one that controls flow rate. A pressure compensated variable displacement pump with load sensing can therefore keep flow rate constant for a given range by maintaining a constant pressure drop across the directional control valve. Given a constant flow rate, actuator rotational speed can be kept inside a desired range, although not necessarily to the degree of response and precision that's capable of using electrical control signals. Again, I'm not a fan of mechanically complex configurations and oil-based pilot signals, 
However, I give full props to this method because it accomplishes a pretty sophisticated means of both pressure and flow control using techniques akin to primitive man performing complex brain surgery with nothing more than sharpened stones, sticks, and torches. Finally, for one of an initial example, kind of let a hydraulic motor-driven conveyor belt steal the show. However, this is by no means the only process that is capable of being controlled. Limitless examples exist, including, but not limited to, speed and or position of a linear hydraulic or pneumatic cylinder, rotational speed and or position of an electrical motor, rotational speed of a generator shaft, angular position of a variable pitch turbine blade, pressure, temperature, or level of some chemical process, and more. While this initial example is relatively simplistic in nature with only a couple variable inputs and disturbances and a single output, consider a more complex system with several actuators and several outputs all working together at a controlled and coordinated process to perform some larger, more complicated function in a changing environment characterized by swarms of unpredictable disturbances. Various degrees of closed-loop control can ensure output remains inside a desired range, despite the complications. Open-loop control systems? Not so much. Alright, that's about it for open-loop control. In conclusion, this lecture examined open-loop control systems. We learned an open-loop control system is a means of process control that does not use feedback to determine if result and output has achieved the desired goal. Consequently, while simple and relatively inexpensive, an open-loop control system cannot automatically correct for errors, nor can it compensate for disturbances. Open-loop control systems require human supervision to ensure their output remains inside an acceptable range. We examine limitations of open-loop control systems when subjected to various disturbances, including internally generated ones like spool position hysteresis, as well as external ones like variations in applied load, friction, temperature, pressure, flow, leakage, and more. Finally, we discussed opportunities for closure and briefly discussed the advantages of a closed-loop control system in terms of response, accuracy, and endurance. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.